Hello, I'm Philip Hooker, VP of Strategic Programs at Software AG, who are an initiator to the open source Finished IO project. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this second Finished IO community meetup. We've got a range of presentations and practical demonstrations from the Finished IO team and contributors, which cover what's new in the latest version, how it can be used and extended, and also real implementation examples. But before I begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you hover your cursor over the main window, the webinar control bar will be shown. These allow you to raise your hand if you have a question, show the meeting chat sidebar, view participants, and leave the webinar. If you have any questions during the session, you can submit them through the chat or raise your hand at the end of the session. The presenters will, uh, the presenters will answer questions at the end of the session, but please feel free to ask questions at any time during the presentations. For those with raised hands, we'll unmute your mic so you can ask your questions directly when called on. We'll also launch a couple of surveys and polls to capture your opinion on important topics between the sessions. These will initially appear as pop-ups, but they will also be available in the meeting chat sidebar after, uh, after for review. What I would do now, so we have a number of um, uh, polls set up. So just to start the ball rolling, if I uh, launch a poll just to uh, gather your your view on some topics. So let me start this one. So now you should see it should see a poll pop up, just giving you a, a quick question regarding uh, your main role in IT projects. So please. Uh, select an item and then uh, submit. Um, also, we have a, a number of different polls that we actually will probably actually update on a um, an interactive basis as we go forwards. So one of the which we're keen to get an idea of is actually uh, what languages you actually use for your embedded projects and in particular your IoT projects related to this. So please, please complete this and uh, fill it in uh, as uh, as you as you need. I'll be introducing the agenda shortly, and our first speaker in just a few minutes. But first, I'd like to say a few words about the Thinedge.io community. The Thinedge.io community is an online and in-person tech enthusiast group who are excited about the practical implementation of Thinedge.io, the open source cloud agnostic IoT framework designed for resource constrained edge devices. We're an eclectic group of IoT, OT and IT professionals from the core development team contributors and the open source community, all experienced in the use of industry proven security, connectivity and software management methods for lightweight devices. During the sessions, we aim to replicate Thinedge.io's no nonsense approach with interactive technology demonstrations so you can learn from both our successes and also our challenges that we face creating them. Uh, we've evolved our approach from the first meetup to allow more time for technical deep dives and interactions with the Finished IO team and collaborators. We'll kick off with a brief recap of the updates in release 0 0.5 of Finished IO from Andre Schreiner from the Finished IO team. Then we'll move into the contributor uh, demonstration from Rob Jones and Matthew Johnson from Software AG uh, to show us how Finished IO can be extended with the Palmer to deliver edge data processing that is efficient to deploy, run, and manage. Both these sessions will be followed by Q&A. We'll then change gears with a live coding session from Lucas from the Finished IO team, who will build a new software management plugin for Finished IO. This then rolls into the Open Guru bar uh, networking. So with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Andre Schreiner. Edge Product Manager from the Thin IO team, who is going to outline the new features and updates of Thin IO that are now available in release 0 0.5. So, Andre, over to you. Thanks a lot, Phil. Hi, and also from my side, welcome to our second Thin um, IO community meetup. So happy to have you all in the call. I see people are still joining, so very good. So, 
Uh, as Phil mentioned, my name is Andre Schreiner. I'm part of the ThinHIO team. I'm helping to drive the vision and strategy of the uh, project. And with our partners, the community and contributors, we are also very keen to collect your input, your feedback to decide where should we go next. So since the last meetup, we have added a lot of great new uh, capabilities in ThinHIO, and that's what I want to give you a quick overview on today. So where do we stand with the project and especially focus on the latest features in 0 0.5? Right, so for the ones who might be very new to the project and the community, I want to emphasize uh, the main objectives of ThinHIO. So with ThinHIO, we want to make device enablement easy and at the same time without creating any ecosystem or platform lock-in for you. To achieve this, we are building a modular lightweight IoT device framework, that's why we call it SYN, as a foundation for your IoT project. It can be deployed on resource-constrained devices, you see some examples here, such as PLC or protocol gateways, and allows out-of-the-box connectivity and most importantly, device management features for the specific device without relying on a specific IoT platform. Uh, and this is where ThinHIO can, can help you. So now most of, you, most of you have seen this, but when developing ThinHIO, we focus on a set of key principles, uh, which are freedom of choice uh, regarding programming languages, message payloads, and the platform, um, a comprehensive and extensible device management with a plugin mechanism to also handle different uh, and support different uh, software artifacts types that need to be managed on such devices and being modular and efficient in terms of resource consumption on the device itself. That means a very low CPU and memory footprint. And all of this, what we're talking about is offered as extensible and also ready to use uh, components uh, supported and driven by the partners involved, but also by the community. Now let's take a quick look on where we stand today and then focus more on the 0 0.5 release highlights. Um, let's start with the MQTT interfaces. Here we are using um, a MQTT broker with various data mappers to handle the cloud uh, connection, but also the inter-service communication. So you can uh, use the simplified ThinEdge JSON MQTT payload um, format, and you do not have to worry about adapting to different payload standards or services or IoT pl platforms if a corresponding cloud mapper exists. We also support so-called child devices, also called leaf devices and in some platforms or downstream devices. So devices, for example, a sensor or asset connected to ThinEdge via a field bus protocol uh, can, re can be represented um, as an own device in the corresponding IoT platform. Now, regarding the IoT platform connectivity itself, we started with Azure IoT and Cumulosity IoT, so two mappers that are available today. You can uh, use them also as a reference. Uh, and this um, supports really out-of-the-box connectivity, a quick registration and connectivity to those platforms which are um, uh, yeah, easy to connect to. Uh, but ThinHIO, I want to emphasize that is not bound to any of those platforms and can be easily extended with additional mappers. So another focus area where we did a lot of development uh, was the area of device management, starting with including a flexible monitoring powered by Collect D, an industry proven uh, monitoring library with uh, extensions, uh, a software management agent, uh, which offers a plugin mechanism. Um, uh, and we will deep dive on that later in the session. Um, and also first plugins to manage Debian packages, for example, or uh, we also have a Docker, a Docker plugin example. Now, now um, for the ease of use to allow the ThinEdge to be easy to use with few commands, we added a command line interface. So um, by uh, using those commands, you can install, you can connect ThinEdge to your IoT platform and, and do certain configurations. And we automate a lot of things behind the scenes. Now, coming to the other modules where ThinEdge can interact with um, uh, plugins or examples, uh, other software that might be running on a device, we have a uh, first great contributions, demos and prototypes coming from the community. 
Uh, one of them will be shown today uh, also by the Software G colleagues uh, on APAMA streaming analytics uh, and other examples um, uh, you have seen in the last meetup already. Uh, um, for example, OT connectivity with IPCOM devices using Node-RED with ThinEdge, but there are also a lot of good examples in our example repository. Great, now let's focus on the uh, release highlights in 0 0.5. What have we added? So first of all, I already mentioned, we uh, included the option to create device hierarchies. Um, so that means you can represent uh, child or leaf devices uh, that are connected to ThinEdge itself in the overarching IoT platform. Uh, you can declare what a device is capable of and report that to IoT platforms as well. This is very useful. Uh, um, then uh, minor things that are also very important, triggering device restarts, uh, but also um, uh, handling log files for the software management. So if you want to see whether software uh, updates um, were successful or you want to check if there are any problems, you also have those logs available. We did a lot of extensions, especially for the Comelosti IT uh, mapper. And last but not least, a very important uh, a change we have made is uh, remo remove the dependency on system D. So you can use ThinEdge IO with your preferred Linux uh, init system. So you can adapt it. And there are also uh, very good um, tutorials and documentation on how to do that uh, in our documentation. Now, how do you get started? Um, best thing to do is obviously to go on GitHub, um, but also check out our docs. You can find it uh, at the top of the page, ThinEdge.io. Um, there you can find a lot of useful stuff, how to use ThinEdge, uh, how to connect your device. Uh, we have tutorials and how-to guides. And uh, you also will find great developer guides on how you can extend ThinEdge, um, uh, how mappers work. Um, so and of course, how to build your own plugins uh, or how to run ThinEdge on other Linux systems or hardware. So check it out. Um, yeah, now before ending, I want to emphasize again, we really want your feedback, your input. Where should we go next? Um, so what do you miss? Um, uh, and uh, what use cases are also uh, important to you. Uh, to give us input, you have, um, yeah, first of all, you have the option to uh, um, look at our roadmap. This contains the um, topics that we want to work on in the next one or two releases that we as a maintainer group decided to, to go based on, on other community feedback, right? But you can also create and vote for new ideas and, and features. And uh, for this, we use GitHub Discussion. Discussions. So if you go in into the uh, GitHub project uh, and click on discussions, you can create your own ideas, you can vote uh, for existing ideas, and you can also take part in the discussions with us um, uh, and, and uh, read what others uh, think and um, comment it on. Now, um, how can you contribute and how can we collaborate? If you are interested in ThinEdge.io and joining us, um, uh, we already work with various partners and we try to grow the list. So if you believe in the idea behind Synedge, no matter if you want to use it or if you want to contribute to it, uh, to it uh, reach out to me uh, on, on, in Discord, for example, and we can discuss how to best collaborate. As you can see, there are different models possible apart, apart from the obvious one, becoming a contributor to the project. We are also looking for investment partners who might be interested in a strategic collaboration uh, or solution partners who want to use ThinEdge as part of their product or service. And of course, hardware and gateway partners are really important to us. So um, partners who also want to uh, build in ThinEdge into their devices. Now, thanks a lot, and back to you, Phil, and the other sessions. Excellent, thanks, Andre. So, uh, let me just quickly share uh, share the slide once again. So, um, uh, so I think uh, Andre is kind of um, sort of covered some interesting topics uh, and plans with Finish.io. Um, so I'm aware uh, a couple of questions have been raised already. Um, what we would like to do um, at this time is to 
um, uh, take to keep on our time schedule. We were just going to launch uh, two polls. We said before about um, having polls as we go through. Uh, so one poll regarding the uh, Linux distribution uh, that you're sort of currently using in your IoT projects. So keen to get your views of actually uh, um, uh, what what tools you have, what sort of software you're using. Then so we will let that run for a moment. Uh, maybe whilst that's quickly running, Andre, there was a question that uh, came in. I don't know if you can see that in the chat regarding. Uh, deployment of uh, Thinedge.io. Uh, I think it's related to would it run on Azure RTOS? Uh, that's not something we um, uh, targeted yet, but yeah, we would be very interested uh, in the use case um, and finding out exactly what you would like to do, but not something we have done so far. Great. And then if we um, quickly launch the the second poll, so regarding the, the challenges you're uh, considering using Thinedge.io at the moment. So just give you a couple of minutes to respond to that. Okay, so I, I know just looking through the chat here, um, we've answered that first question. And I know there'll be sort of later questions that come up. Um, so to keep on our schedule, we we have a sort of Q and A sessions after each uh, after each presenter, and actually one at the very end. So um, now <clears throat> now let's change gears. Um, so uh, once again, thank thank you, Andre. So uh, let's change gears and actually understand how our contributors are leveraging Finedge.io. So uh, data processing in edge devices is not new, but what has changed is the amount of data that needs to be processed, the sophistication of the processing algorithms, and the need to frequently update the algorithms in live deployments. So with this, I'd like to introduce Rob Jones, Analytics Product Manager, and Matthew Johnson, Analytics Software Architect from Software AG, who will show how Thinedge.io can be extended with a Palmer to deliver edge data processing that is efficient to deploy, run and manage. So Rob, over to you. Thanks, Phil. Let me share my screen. OK, so hopefully that's uh, all being shared. Um, OK, so I am Rob Jones. I'm the product manager in Software AG uh, for Streaming Analytics. And thank you for inviting me today to spend a few minutes just showing you how we think our customers can best use um, streaming analytics on the thinedge.io uh, platform and it really gets really get to use streaming analytics on um, with some I think pretty essential use cases uh, for those devices. So I'm joined today with um, my colleague uh, Matthew Johnson. He's from the R&D team so he's going to be taking you through a, a live demonstration of, of how we can use stream analytics on thinedge.io. So I'm going to start off with a introduction for stream to, to streaming analytics. Now, apologies if you know what streaming analytics is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make this very, very brief. Uh, streaming analytics is a dedicated technology for looking at large amounts of fast moving data in real time and performing actions on, you know, on that analysis very, very quickly, i.e. with low latency. So I think of there's two types of streaming analytics. One is when you're um, uh, looking at discrete events, you're looking at individual things that have happened and you're looking for a pattern. So you're looking for uh, a temperature um, exceeding a, a, a limit and then you're looking for vibration exceeding a limit. Now, if those two things happen in a very short space of time, then you might want to raise an alert and alarm. And then the other type of streaming analytics is to look at the data stream as a whole and to do something against all the data points on that stream. So looking at the uh, the temperature measurements as the as they're coming in, but then calculating aggregates like averages, means, uh, standard deviations on that data stream. So streaming analytics, I think, covers both of these um, these types of analysis, and I'm going to go through how we can how we can do that uh, using ThinEdge.io. Uh, where can streaming analytics be deployed? Well, the answer is pretty much everywhere. 
So we, in Software AG, we provide streaming analytics for use in the cloud, in a containerized environment. Uh, we use it for, uh, we provide it for use on servers, and we also provide it for use on edge devices, whether they're the, the, the thicker, more powerful um, a PC, industrial PC uh, type edge devices, or something a much lighter, like the uh, ARM-based uh, devices. So lots to read on this slide, and I'm not expecting you to read it at all, um, but I wanted to give a flavour for the types of use cases we have for streaming analytics. And I think of there's two types of use cases. One is the streaming analytics we would do against the device as a whole. So you can see, looking down the, uh, the the column on the left, you can see the sort of use cases that I that I see all the time with our with our customers. So they're looking at the types of alarms that are being raised and seeing is there a pattern in those alarms? Is it one alarm a day? Is it ten alarms in two seconds? And you can do the analysis just on the on the uh, on the uh, types of alerts or alarms that are being raised. Um, and I'm, I can't get through each of these in, in the short space of time I've got, but um, you know, other other very, very well um, known use cases would be around um, predicting maintenance. When is the best time to um, to service my my device if it if it in, if it needs servicing? And then anything to do with remote control or monitoring is, of course, something that uh, uh, many, many uh, customers uh, are doing. So they are the device focused use cases. We also have data focused use cases. So looking at the data um, uh, specifically uh, rather than how the device is behaving. So looking at the data again, these are just a bunch of um, examples that we that we that I see um, in our in our industry. So people want to do um, aggregates on the data. So instead of sending uh, instead of identifying all the data points, I think what's sometimes more important is to look at the trends. So to look at the averages over over the past, say, five minutes, and looking for anomalies in the data. Um, so learning uh, what the data should look like and then identifying anom uh, anomalous data points. And then there's a, there's a bunch here. So condition monitoring is possibly the most used example for streaming analytics. And it's, it's things that you may do today uh, where you're looking at, um, at a, a measurement, comparing it against a threshold or a limit, and then if it's exceeding those uh, those limits, then raising an alarm and alert. That is the, 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 the one of the simplest and possibly the, the most common type of uh, streaming analytics. But I'm providing these use cases just to try and, um, and make you think that there's there's a lot that streaming analytics can do for the data that's going through your device. So today we're going to uh, show you uh, one example, and this example. Um, is available from the uh, it, it's uh, it's from available from the GitHub repository and that we'll share with you uh, later. And the idea for this example is to highlight how we can um, um, deal with a limited bandwidth scenario where batching and compression are techniques used to deal with that limited bandwidth. So sometimes, and it's very frequent to be fair, uh, devices can generate more data than we sometimes want to deal with. Um, sensors can generate readings multiple times per second. And if you've got multiple sensors, that is a lot of data being generated every second. And do we want to process all that data? Um, so sending all the data off device can be heavy on bandwidth. And if you're paying for that data transfer, it can also be very expensive. So what we're going to be doing here is looking at the, at the raw data and seeing if we can identify the trends and the means and the values over time windows um, and use streaming analytics to change the, the raw data points on the left of the graph here into the, the more meaningful and, uh, and uh, lower frequency data points on the, uh, on the right graph here. And that will allow us to save on bandwidth and hopefully save our costs too. So we are using streaming analytics for this. Um, we're going to calculate the average pressure uh, temperature and vibration coming off our uh, the sensors on our device, and we're going to calculate those averages over a five second window. Then we're going to batch those, we're going to combine those into a single measurement structure, and then every five seconds we're going to send that out over MQTT 
to the uh, the cloud environment for uh, monitoring and alerting purposes. So we're getting a lot of data in every second. We're going to combine that, average it, and then send it out every five seconds. So we're drastically reducing the amount of data that we're sending out. So Matthew will take us through that in a, in a few seconds. For this demonstration, we're using the Aparma streaming analytics uh, platform, the, the engine that uh, uh, we call Aparma. And you'll see from the demonstration that Aparma includes its own domain specific language. Now that DSL called EPL is, uh, is very similar to Java and C++, but it's aimed entirely at making event driven pattern matching and stream manipulation as easy to develop as possible. Uh, that is the reason we have a DSL, is to make the task at hand as easy to uh, accomplish as possible for developers. Now, there's a, there's a number of advantages to using uh, a Palmer and its own um, and, and EPL. Now, one of them is it allows you to separate, if you're developing a, a device, it allows you to separate the control process within the PLC from the streaming analytics logic. So that means that your streaming analytics will not be running interchangeably with the same code that you've got running uh, controlling your device. And it allows a developer to focus purely on the streaming analytics at hand without thinking, how do they combine that streaming analytics logic into the PLC uh, logic as well? And Aparma is aimed at giving you high throughput with a, you know, a, a, a finite amount of resources, and it's therefore optimized for performance out of the box. So while you can do your own optimization, you can rest assured that a Palmer will provide that optimization out of the box, ready to go. A Palmer has a relatively small footprint, which makes it perfect for thin edge devices. So it's not a, a Java based application and therefore doesn't suffer from the overheads of running a memory hungry JVM. It can be used on Linux um, environments or Windows, but um, um, for thin edge, we ex we would expect uh, our customers to be using Linux and it works on x86 uh, and uh, ARM v7 architectures. Now this example we're showing um, is running within 30 meg of RAM. It's using less than 100 meg of storage space. And if you're tracking CPU usage, well, we're processing 10 events per second in our example approximately and it's using less than 1% CPU on our Raspberry Pi to do that. But if you wanted to max out that Raspberry Pi, then consider approximately 30,000 events per second doing the uh, the limited bandwidth example that we have, which is a, 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 yeah, a very large number of events per second, as you can imagine. Um, Aparma is, is proven, it's robust, it's not a, a new product, it's been matured over a number of years, it's maintained by Software AG and it's available commercially, uh, fully supported by Software AG, or you can use the free to use community edition. Um, and that's what, we've, what we're using for this demonstration here. And finally, if you want to find out more information about Aparma, what you've seen in the demonstration, then there is a, uh, an Aparma community site in the top right hand corner of this uh, slide. You can see the web address, aparmacommunity.com. You can go there for all the downloads and documentation. Um, there's a bunch of resources available to you, um, including blog posts uh, written by Palmer developers themselves, as well as from, from customers. There's tutorials in video form. Um, there's access to the GitHub repositories for samples and utilities. Uh, know that there's a Stack Overflow, a Palmer tag, and uh, I would recommend using the tech community, which is also linked in the, in the top of the slide, if you want to have a, a discussion with the Palmer experts on helping you do what you want to do. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Matthew to take us through the demonstration. Thanks, Rob. Hello, everybody. Uh, today, I'd like to walk you through the process of building, testing and deploying a streaming analytics application for ThinEdge.io. I'm going to be using the Software AG uh, designer, which we provide with the full Palmer installation uh, as the uh, IDE, uh, but we do also have support for using a variety of other common uh, development environments as well. I'm also going to be using uh, Software AG's Cumulosity IoT as the 
cloud that Thin Edge is connected to uh, and show its software deployment features uh, via the cloud. This slide shows the architecture I'm going to demonstrate today. I should be using Designer to write an application. And I'm using the built in Apollo instance there to uh, test this during development connected to a test thin edge.io installation that I have. Uh, and then once it's done, I'm going to deploy that application via Cumulosity to a thin edge device, uh, which is then going to run the application within the Apollo on the device and then talk directly to uh, Cumulosity. So let me switch to uh, a screen share to start the demo. Right, so first, here is my tenant on uh, Cumulosity. You can see I've already got a thin edge device set up and connected, uh, but it's not currently producing any measurements. The sensor data is currently being published uh, within thin edge.io, but it's not being sent to the cloud. So we're going to start here in uh, the uh, software AG designer. This is our development environment for writing streaming analytics applications. As Rob said, Apama has a domain specific language called EPL, uh, which is expressly designed for creating real time event based streaming applications. And that's what I'm going to be demonstrating today. So I'm starting here with essentially a blank project. I've configured it to connect to uh, the MQTT broker on my test thin edge instance. And this will allow me to test the code whilst developing it before deploying it to the edge for real. Uh, so I've also configured a few uh, event types, uh, which we're going to use for the sensor events uh, that are being sent uh, from the, within the device being received by uh, Apama, and also the combined measurement event that's going to be published out to uh, the cloud. So back to the application. EPL applications start in the onload method here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to subscribe to um, the measurements that are coming from the um, sensors on the device. So here this is going to read temperature events. Then um, we're just going to start by receiving all the events uh, and just logging those out to the console so we can see that it's working. Uh, or, you know, potentially you could have a simple threshold where you're looking for events uh, which are above some kind of warning threshold and then uh, produce a warning to the log. Uh, so let's test this out. Uh, so if I uh, run the um, project here, then uh, this is uh, going to uh, start up the correlator, which is our uh, engine that runs uh, Apama and runs the application. The console here shows us uh, the log output from the correlator. As you can see, we're getting a lot of data that's being produced by the sensors, but you know, just receiving that and logging it to the console is not very useful. So instead, let's try sending that data to the cloud. So if I replace this, then you can see here we're sending this out to a different channel, and this is the one that's going to be published up to uh, my Cumulosity tenant. So let's run that one. Um, so this, like I say, contains all the information coming out of the correlator. Uh, we're no longer getting a big spam of events, but in the status lines, if you look at the TX off to the right here, you can see that we are sending um, data fairly regularly. And if I switch over to my tenant and go to the measurements, uh, let's just switch that down to current, you can see we're producing um, a lot of measurements here which are coming from the device. However, this is a lot of data. As Rob said, many devices have restricted bandwidth um, and it's also very spiky. So we want to smooth it out and we want to only publish it periodically. So first of all, let's create an average and populate that. So I'm going to replace my uh, listener that just receives all the events here and I'm going to replace it with uh, one of our uh, streaming constructs here. 
So this is using EPL's built-in streaming features to calculate a mean over a window. Uh, the result of that mean is then going to be published up to the cloud as we had before. Uh, so this is going to smooth out the data. So let's run that and see what that looks like. So if we come back over to the tenant, then we can see that um, the data is now being produced in a much smoother fashion. Uh, this is from our uh, aggregate. Uh, however, we're still publishing this very, very quickly, and we're still only doing one of these measurements that um, we were looking for. So let's come back over to the code again. Uh, the final version I'm going to show you today is uh, what you'll see in our examples repository, which you can go and look up on GitHub. Uh, so we're going to start with that by not just receiving the temperature measurements, we're also going to subscribe to the other two types of uh, sensor data that we're looking for. Uh, now we want to calculate averages for each of those. So instead, we're going to have three of these um, stream uh, components. Uh, and instead of sending them out as soon as we've calculated the current, we're going to just store them for later in these variables. Finally, we want to periodically uh, do a little bit of data sanitization to make sure that what we're sending up is good and then publish those up to the cloud. Uh, this also shows off the way that you can in EPL combine declarative concepts such as the uh, stream um, statements there along with event-based primitives with the um, on listener and then just general um, imperative code which allows you to create uh, a lot more sort of flex flexibly and more powerful applications as you can combine these together and it allows you to write applications which are a lot more flexible and can respond to changing conditions. Right, let's run this uh, version that we have here. So now if we want look at the console, what you'll see is that there are periodically events being created, but a lot less frequently. So you can see we're sending these uh, with our averages here. And we can switch back to the tenant and we can now see uh, that we will be getting data. Let's switch that all to minute view. We can see that you're getting data on all three graphs. And it's this slow, much more slowly evolving and uh, infrequent uh, events being published. So that's all great. And uh, now we've got the application where we want it, but what we don't want is to be running it on my developer instance. So uh, let's stop that. Now we're going to deploy it uh, through, the, um, through the Cumulosity Cloud. Uh, and a Palmer project can just be deployed to a directory with a bunch of files in it. And so I've just put that in a zip file, which I'm going to use to deploy into the cloud. To do that, I need to switch over to the software repository uh, and add a new piece of software, which we can have deployed. Uh, so the values I'm going to put in here uh, just have some um, Uh, in the version here, I need to specify what sort of uh, project it is so that ThinAge knows how to deploy it. Okay. And then I just need to drag and drop the zip file with all of my uh, project in it here, uh, and I can upload that. Now I've got the, uh, the uh, project uploaded. I can switch back to my device. And I can use the software tab here to deploy it out to the device. So if I click install software, again, you can see it's all offered here, the thing we've just uploaded. I can select that. And now when I click apply changes, you can see it runs this to deploy it to the device. And now it should be up and running on the device. Again, it stopped here. We're not running it locally. But if we switch back over to the measurements here, uh, we can again see that. Uh, we're getting updates here periodically, and this is from the um, application that's running on the Edge device itself.
So I hope that has given you all a brief overview of the workflow of building a streaming analytics application with a Palmer and with Cumulosity. Thank you very much. I think we probably have a few minutes now for Rob and I to answer some questions that you may have about using streaming analytics and thin edge. So I'm going to hand back over to Phil to see if we have any questions. Brilliant, excellent. So, um, well, th thanks, Rob, and thanks, Matt. So, kind of, um, I, I know uh, the discussion regarding um, having um, uh, edge edge data processing is actually one of the ones that one of the topics that came up at the last meetup. So, I'm kind of, it's good good to go through that now. So, um, just looking through the the questions, there's there's one here regarding um, let's say the, the comparative advantages of a Palmer compared to Node-RED, because I know, I think in the one of the early questions, um, Node-RED was one of the most heavily used kind of programming tools for the IoT um, people have actually joined. So could, could you articulate, um, I don't know, why, why a Palmer rather than Node-RED, or maybe there's some, there's some situations that make one better than the other? I can give a couple of thoughts on it. Um, you know, there's no doubt that uh, Node-RED is a, you know, it is a popular environment. Um, so, you know, it certainly has its, has its uses. Um, but I would highlight that a Palmer provides a, a level of performance, which is, you know, which Node-RED can't really, you know, um, you know, compete with. The overheads are super low with, with a Palmer um, compared to, you know, implementing a, the Node-RED environment on a, um, you know, on devices. And um, a Palmer has been you know, used for, you know, performance use cases for a, a number of years um, that has meant that it's you know it's optimized and it's extremely efficient. Um, I do get that, that that some some customers, some developers like the no code environment, um, and uh, it's something that we are looking to introduce to the uh, thin edge, the IO in the future, in the cloud and uh, and the thick edge uh, f uh, within Cumulosity. Uh, we have a you know a drag and drop. Um, environment for building streaming analytics, but our uh, initial offering for for ThinEdge.io is is definitely focused on the the developers where performance and the low overheads are uh, are, are the the key constraint. But good question. Yep, yep. Um, so, uh, so one of your sort of comments there, Rob, was um, regarding sort of a previous uses of uh, a Palmer, uh, obviously in. Um, uh, High high data transfer environment. So, uh, I think there was obviously some cases before regarding kind of the finance sector. So they they look for you know, patterns and trends using the tooling. So, are, are some of those um, models and methods readily available to be used on more uh, operational technology environments? I know you went through a number of use cases there for data processing and for um, uh, let's say device device management. So, are, are some of those uh, uh I'd, I'd say, easily reusable i'd say the um um rather than um yes absolutely is the answer um but uh it, it's it's one of the benefits of having a domain specific language it's in you know, palmer's epl is entirely geared around making um pattern matching in an event based um uh, environment uh, as easy to use as possible um, it requires far fewer lines of code than trying to write that in any other language and the fewer lines of code make it quicker to write and much much easier to to maintain um so rather than saying you could uh, you know you could embed a lot of you know existing third party libraries i would highlight at this point that the uh, the the domain specific language for palmer makes creating these streaming analytics applications which are doing pattern matching or they're doing analysis over the whole stream uh, really really straightforward really simple for a a developer yep no great great um, and maybe um, I know this time's coming on, but maybe kind of one last question. So I know um, the so a, a Palm is pretty self-contained, isn't it? So um, you sort of manage that um, uh, manage that unit in, in itself. So d does that also provide um, some sort of differentiation against, uh, let's say, other other mechanisms to do analytics? So you 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 sort of separate some of the uh, the data, I, I, data I, I, processing from other code. I think you might be referring to yeah a couple of points I was trying to make on one yeah. of the slides, which is that um, um on the uh, on many lightweight devices uh, we see our developers or we see developers trying to embed streaming analytics logic inside the C or C plus plus code 
you know, the, that's running on that device. And whilst that might be good for straightforward use cases, it doesn't make it you know, as easy to maintain as, as separating out that logic. And that's where uh, a Palmer can come in and Palmer's a, you know, a, a separate component um, that runs in a very small footprint that allows you to put all the streaming analytics logic in one place. Um, it allows you to maintain that separately from the, the PLC logic itself. Um, and that gives you, you know, many benefits when running on a small platform um, uh, where performance and accuracy and uptime are you know, very important. Yep, uh, great. Um, so I think that's kind of a kind of run of time time for the Q and A. But I know, you've, uh, so Rob and Matt, you can actually you already referenced some of the um, uh, the tutorials and use cases are on the Thinedge IO website and also the Palmer Community website. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, so if I just share share my intro slide again. So now we would like to kind of pivot towards. Um, so something we're doing that's quite new. So we so we, we haven't done this before. Um, we'd like to do kind of a live a live coding session, sort of based on some of the requests that were raised at the previous meetup. Um, so we realise that today's embedded software engineers and IoT solution developers need to manage the development of their connected products to satisfy both the initial time, quality, and cost criteria of the build, plus also the ongoing maintenance effort. So allowing IoT devices to support a broad range of proven apps, regardless of the way they have been packaged, so whether they've been packaged as binary, Docker, Debian, or something else, is actually essential to accelerate innovation and ensure that device software can be efficiently managed longer term. So with that, I'd like to introduce Lucas from the Thinish.io team, who's going to show us how a new software management plugin can be built for Thinish.io right in front of our eyes. So Lucas, over to you. In only 15 minutes, Phil. Thank you so much, Phil. Hi, very welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Lukas Wozniki. Uh, I am a software engineer working with uh, Finage, and we've been building this framework for, for a while now. So uh, we wanted to present, uh, show you how we can easily extend uh, some of the functionality. Um, so, oops, sorry, presentations. Probably not ah, click. Right. So the first thing I would like to actually start today with uh, is a short presentation. So um, very similarly to, to the previous presentation, I have had uh, set up my device previously with uh, Finnish uh, already running with right, this type of a device, Finnish IO, um, and go straight to the point. So the for the for the software management, uh, we often use different package managers, managers and. Uh, it's sometimes maybe very daunting how you would manage uh, those software. And with the extensibility of Finish, um, I can add uh, different uh, plugins. So I wanted to show you my device again. Uh, right, so uh, my device is already running uh, Finish IO uh, on board. And I just wanted to uh, quickly show you how easily it can be to manage uh, software on, on that device. So we're going to be talking about uh, Snap today. Uh, I have already uh, put uh, some snap uh, Snaps inside uh, my device. Uh, and if I just do install and then apply changes, that's going to send a couple of commands uh, to my device. You can see the status here. We should see in a couple of seconds now it succeeded. And I just quickly refresh my list. Uh, I know I probably went quite quickly, but now we can see another uh, package installed on the device. So this is what we're going to do today. Uh, pretty much how simple uh, it's going to be to to install or remove uh, software on your device. I'll just quickly now remove that from my device. Mm -hmm. And OK. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. Oh. Right, so before I jump uh, into the coding, I would like to uh, give you a quick refresher regarding the architecture and uh, how Finish is, how is it possible that uh, building uh, such components uh, with Finish is so straightforward. So um, if you uh, look here, you can uh, identify uh, the standards uh, here, uh, our bus uh, and some of the data mappers which are responsible for uh, exchanging the messages with, with the cloud. 
uh, and uh, further down the line, uh, actually the component which we are going to be focusing on today. Oh, sorry. Oops. And everything's broken. It was much better yesterday. <clears throat> Uh, so the component which we are going to be focusing on today, which is uh, device management agent, uh, as well as uh, the plugins. So uh, just to quickly uh, uh, summarize, uh, the part we are going to work on today is, is that that software management plugin, uh, which is uh, a dependency uh, for for an agent to so to support a new package managers. Uh, sorry, yes, new package managers. Uh, we can just add a new plugin. Uh, out of the box, uh, Finish uh, comes with an APT uh, plugin for for Debian distributions, uh, as it is one of the base, basic uh, methods we uh, distributed. Uh, but we also offer you some uh, basic implementation for the Docker plugin. So if you would like to try it, uh, feel free to do so. Um, but uh, what's so uh, great about the software management plugins is that even though the agent and, and the core of the finish is, is written in Rust. Those uh, components or those uh, plugins can be written in pretty much any language. Uh, so today we'll be doing this uh, with Python. Uh, but before we jump into that coding, uh, I'll do a little bit more about the contract between uh, the plugin, uh, the agent and the cloud. Um, so if you imagine here on this side, uh, we have uh, our cloud mapper. Uh, which is connected to to, to our cl uh, cloud, wherever it is going to be. In my case is Cumulosity. Uh, and on the device, uh, simultaneously going to have running a, an SM agent. Uh, so the agent uh, is a main process uh, running around the executing operations on Finage. Uh, and therefore, any requests coming from the cloud after translation uh, by the cloud mapper, they can be, uh, they, they will be. Uh, pushed out to the agent. And depending on the type of the operation request, so in our case, it's going to be a, a, some kind of software software uh, update or software list request, they're going to, uh, the agent will uh, invoke the appropriate plugin. Um, that's either going to be for APT or, or as, as we're going to do, do today, uh, it's going to be a snap. Uh, so what happens uh, between the agent and the plugin, uh, they, uh, do exchange uh, small information uh, package via the plugin API. Uh, that's a command line interface uh, that is hap hap happening uh, due to the agent actually uh, calling the software management plugin as a child uh, process in the agent itself. So uh, they can easily exchange exit codes and uh, other uh, parts of, of the messaging system. Um, so to give you uh, a little bit more details uh, about more complex operations, I'll probably zoom in, it will be easier to read that. Uh, we're still having uh, the same components, the software management agent plugin and on the right hand side mapper, uh, which is going to be a little bit less relevant at this point as, uh, oops, try again. Um, so what happens when a uh, software management uh, agent receives an operation uh, it will store uh, some state in, uh, internally uh, to just uh, be sure that we are uh, after any crashes, reboots, or, or power losses, we still can continue uh, execution of the operation. But uh, the agent will uh, call a few commands, which are defined by the plugin API, uh, and the plugin should respond to directly to the agent uh, with predefined uh, responses. Uh, so. By, by those responses, what I mean, uh, the, the main way of communicating is the exit codes of the processes, uh, as well as, in some cases, uh, standard outputs and standard errors. So it's mainly for uh, the list command. <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, the process, uh, sorry, not the process, but um, Whenever agent uh, invokes uh, the plugin, uh, it's going to invoke it uh, with a certain order of uh, operations. So always when you have a software update request, so either install or, or remove uh, an application, uh, there will be a command called prepare, uh, which we can, we will, I'll show you what we can do with that. But 
it's going to be either update cache or, or update some configurations depending on whatever your uh, plugin supports. Uh, after that, the agent uh, from the right-hand side is going to uh, call uh, the install operation. So default way of invoking that is by support, by uh, calling, by, by sorry, <laughs> by providing so-called uh, update list. Uh, this list uh, it should be provided on the standard input for the plugin. Uh, but in our case uh, of Snap, because Snap, uh, as far as I know, uh, does not support um, multiple types of operations in a single call. Uh, for example, uh, you can't install and remove in the same. So for the, in, in, in like APT uh, case, you can call uh, apt install, but you can put this, I think, believe this was uh, the dash to actually remove uh, the software in the same command. So in our case, the uh, agent will uh, call the plugin uh, with, with the uh, requested packages one by one. Uh, as if that would be a remove command, uh, it would also call it like that. And at the last part of the request, still on the uh, from the agent, uh, the plugin would be asked to uh, finalize. So in case uh, we will have some cleanup to do after the installs, we can also add these uh, additional operations uh, to, 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 to be executed by the plugin as the last step of the uh, installation. Uh, and as, as the last part, because uh, we need to also update the state in the cloud, uh, we will request the list uh, from our plugin. Okay. I hope I didn't go too fast over that. Uh, I have a link, uh, so all of that is documented and it's, it's in our the documentation repository. So I, I, I will share the links obviously with everyone that is gonna be available uh, in the code example, uh, as well as on this presentation, I believe. Uh, right, to just quickly summarize, uh, just to summarize, so what we're gonna do today uh, is the quick uh, implementation of a plugin in Python. Uh, we are going to uh, implement the three basic commands uh, for the plugin, which is install, remove, list. Uh, unfortunately for today, we won't, we won't focus on the update list. I think there will be a way to work around that. We, we, we could do it, but it would be a little bit longer session how, how to do it properly. Uh, okay. So I'll now switch to code. This, this, and that. So I have prepared uh, just a skeleton of, of an application in Python. Uh, I use Click as my uh, command line interpreter. Uh, feel free to, to use whatever you actually need or are more used to it. And you can do exactly the same thing with arc bars. Uh, I have made a couple of assumptions already that, uh, first of all, we obviously have our snap already on the device properly installed and configured. So, so if I'm gonna call on my device here, uh, snap uh, version, for example. The snap is, as you can see, installed and configured uh, and running. Uh, and the second, I think, quite obvious part as well, uh, my finish, uh, it, finish deployment is, is uh, on the device as well. So uh, all the services for finish are, are running and, and are very happy to exchange messages with me. <clears throat> right. Um, I'll come back to the uh, status codes uh, in a second. Uh, and I think the best or the easiest command to implement uh, will be the list command. So uh, this is the most basic command supported by SM plugin, uh, software management plugin. Uh, and this will be uh, called actually quite quick, uh, quite often uh, uh, as far as uh, when it's called, it's, it's um, pretty much on every single uh, mapper reset currently. So we will ask uh, for the current status of the list uh, of, of the software on our uh, device, such that the agent will gather all the available plugins and then will then forward the list to, 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 to Cumulosity to your cloud. So as you can see on, on here, I also have an APT plugin on my device installed. So the other uh, applications are those installed by APT. Okay. Right, um, all the specifications very similar to um, to uh, how tos guides are available in our uh, GitHub repository. Uh, I'll have links uh, over here, and very similar to uh, actually what I'm doing today is also available as a how to guide. 
uh, again, links available here. Uh, the code I'm writing today uh, will also be available in, in Finnish examples repository. Uh, so you can always go there if you have any proposed changes or you'd like to extend it. Uh, please uh, feel free to, to, to go there and take it and, and you know, play around it. Right. Um, so with snap, uh, to list the available software on the device, there is a command called snap, uh, snap list. Uh, so as you can actually can uh, see, I've got a couple of uh, snaps installed. And uh, what it does, as you can see here, uh, it returns uh, on standard output, it returns the list of software uh, currently installed with, with some headers and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, what the agent is actually expecting is a tab separated list of values uh, and the agent only needs the name and the version of uh, currently installed uh, snap. So uh, let's start with some basics. Uh, so first thing I want to do here is to invoke the process. Um, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, so I want to invoke my uh, process. Uh, so Python is one of probably many ways of doing this. Um, and in this process invocation, I want to call my snap uh, with uh, the parameter or argument list, as, as we just saw on the command line. Uh, there are a couple of things I need to modify to, to make it look a little bit better and also to have uh, additional reporting uh, also uh, with it, in case we have a failure of the software. Uh, there are logs on the device uh, created by the agent via capturing the standard output uh, and standard error. So, so that is really useful when you want to debug remotely. Uh, so to do that in Python, okay, there may be some better ways, but uh, we just pipe our standard output and the same we're gonna do for our error. Uh, dun, dun, dun. And uh, one other thing I found actually very recently, uh, so let me change Python, uh, it's quite useful to add these universal uh, new lines characters here. Right, so what we have here now uh, is the invocation of uh, our snap uh, with the uh, subcommand list. Uh, I'm going to store that in, in our proc. Um, Obviously, very important informa information we now need to know is if that succeeded. Uh, so, return code. So, if it didn't succeed, here we have to uh, change a little bit uh, our exit code. So, the way the agent and, and plugin uh, relate to each other is that. Uh, but default basic information for the agent uh, about the invocation of the plugin is the exit code of the of the child process. So uh, we have uh, four basic uh, codes defined currently. So obviously uh, error code uh, or exit code zero is, is the success. There is the failure on number two, uh, and we can also going to use number one today uh, in one of the commands. I'll get to that in a couple of minutes, few minutes. Uh, so in, in the case if our invocation fails, we want to return uh, exit code 2. So this is what we're doing in this line here. Uh, now we have to do a little bit of uh, string manipulation because we need to convert this format uh, into this uh, much simpler tab separated uh, value. So again, there may be better ways, but uh, I'll just quickly uh, try to split lines there, and these are all delimited by a space, a white space character, and line terminator. And we have to indicate that it's a slash n, because for some weird reason, someone chosen that the dict reader actually uh, defaults to slash r slash n. Uh, yeah. So now having that, uh, the only thing left uh, to do, as I already mentioned, all the uh, output should be pre sorry, yeah, all, all the, the whole list should be printed to the standard output, which will be captured uh, by the agent. Uh, and therefore, we can do simply uh, happy enough using 
Python free, so that's a fairly simple operation. And we have a name as our uh, header name, yep. And then we want to separate it by tab. And here, version, okay. Uh, and this is pretty much what we need. So if I now test my snap plugin, if I just call snap and list, oh, I forgot about this. Uh, quite uh, easy way or, or the way I, I most of the time debug these uh, when writing a plugin uh, is just invoke them in a command line because bear in mind that it's gonna be pretty much exactly the same way as the agent would, would uh, invoke them. So. Uh, our snap list currently has, uh, sorry, it's a little bit of confusion I may be introducing now. So here on this, this right hand side, you can see that I have uh, invoked snap uh, without the dot slash. Uh, this is because this is a system command uh, responsible for uh, the snap CLI. Whereas this uh, dot uh, slash is invoking my uh, current, current plugin on my device. So, um, this this is exactly this executable I'm invoking. Uh, okay, cool. So this seems to be working. It 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 uh, creates exactly the uh, expected output here. Uh, right. So this is tested. Next part of our plugin to be implemented uh, will be, I suppose, the two most uh, interesting, maybe not interesting, but. Uh, important commands for, for our software management. So how to install and remove a command. Um, the code in here uh, requires a little bit more parameters. So uh, the first parameter uh, captured by the uh, plugin needs to be a name of the software we want to install. Uh, and second uh, is the version and then third is the file. Um, so some package managers, uh, unfortunately, Snap does not uh, support the explicit version uh, installation. Uh, with Snap, there are ways to 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 uh, work around that. We can uh, make it to work in a developer mode, uh, but then after a first auto update, it would uh, revert back or actually uh, sync up with the latest stable anyway, or latest on the current channel anyway. So uh, I decided that, that for this demo, uh, it just makes no, no, it's not practical to implement the uh, particular version uh, installation. Uh, and the file, in the case, if you need to uh, install from local uh, drive, or if you need to download uh, your package from, from some other source than a publicly available stores or, or repositories. So in case of Snap, uh, it would be a Snap store. Uh, you can download this from external source and the agent will, will manage to downloading that and, and then uh, ask the plugin to install that. But again, for Snap, without enabling the developer uh, access to the Snaps, it's not possible as far as I'm aware. <clears throat> um, actually, there is not much new code we need to write because uh, bear in mind that a plugin is just as thin as possible layer uh, to uh, talk to our package manager. Uh, you know, the, the, the layer is basically plugin API uh, and internally the plugin, whichever language you want to write it, shell, Python, Rust, uh, it, it has to call uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate package manager commands. Mm -hmm. So small change which we need to do obviously here, one is to uh, say that we want to install. Uh, and the other thing uh, we want to do is to uh, say which package we would like to install. Um, so yeah, in our case uh, for snap, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, sorry, uh, the command is install, and then it requires a name of the package to be installed. That's taken from uh, our std, in, uh, sorry, uh, our uh, command line parameters. Uh, okay. <laughs> Funnily enough, uh, that, that is pretty much all we need to do uh, as uh, because we're piping the STD out and error uh, from the sub process, uh, we don't actually need to return uh, much here. Uh, and only in, in the case of error, we want to uh, return exit code too. Uh, we have very, very similar situation uh, with remove. Um, so uh, the difference between install and remove is that 
uh, remove object does not require a local file. So uh, we're only going to uh, provide a name and a version if the package manager would support that. Right. Um, so for our snap, uh, we require to change the command to to, to be remove. Uh, and uh, one additional thing, which I think is a good practice for especially uh, edge devices, is to add this small uh, switch over here, uh, which gonna force removal of all the uh, snapshots, metadata, or like rema remainings after the removal of, of that package. Cool. Um, so now we have uh, list, install, and remove. Uh, so pretty much the basic API currently implemented. Uh, there are three more, uh, three more uh, methods, three more functions which I have prepared here, uh, which I already mentioned before that there is the uh, prepare and our finalize. So in finalize, we are not going to do anything. So we just simply pass here, but we still uh, need to uh, implement that for our plugin because if we're not going to return uh, zero exit, uh, exit code zero, uh, that will uh, would tell the agent that something something wrong happened. It, it would fail the whole operation. Uh, and uh, for the prepare, uh, we can actually do one thing here for snap. Uh, it's actually similar to our, uh, not our in general the uh, APT or other uh, things which rely on. Uh, on shops or, or external uh, spelling is difficult and um, external repositories. Um, so every time we receive an update operation or, or if for the plugin, uh, we would like our repositories to be actually uh, nice and fresh and then do exactly, uh, excuse me, always install the latest version. So uh, in snap, there's a command uh, refresh. Um, as I already mentioned, there is also our special case, uh, the update list. Uh, currently, I, I don't believe the snap supports it or not in a straightforward way. We could probably uh, do some, uh, you know, accept the whole list and do processing and splitting between install and remove. Um, but uh, but yes, uh, I decided we're just gonna uh, leave it to the agent, just, just you know, show you how, how simply it may be. Uh, but uh, to actually make it fully working uh, and to let know the agent that actually we do not support this operation, uh, there is this special exit code uh, one, uh, which we can return from the plugin for uh, the update list. And uh, Yes, uh, that is pretty much our whole implementation we need to have this uh, simple uh, simple plugin uh, up and running. The last thing left here uh, is to actually install that plugin. Uh, so if you just give me a second, I'll just quickly re here and touch that plugin. Um, so what to do to install your plugin? That's also actually, I suppose, a good question. Um, so I'll demonstrate that on my dev machine. Um, so all the plugins need to be put in an etc tag SM plugins uh, directory. Uh, this is a special directory in the uh, tag uh, configuration uh, directory uh, where we uh, keep uh, all the plugins, other operation configurations and stuff. Uh, but here, as you can see, I already have uh, copied before uh, a file, but if I would be doing this right now, I would do my snap.py uh, with sudo uh, to my etc uh, tech, uh, oops, not plugins, obviously, but sm plugins. And the important part here is, is the name. So as you can see here, uh, I'm dropping the .py extension uh, because uh, if I would leave the extension, the plugin would be registered as snap.py, uh, and therefore I could have you know, weird uh, type of, of like snap.py. So, so therefore, whatever the name of the plugin uh, in the uh, in touch, that's what we will see up uh, in our uh, in our cloud. Um, okay. 
I think that is pretty much all I have to show you guys. Um, just to uh, just to get this one up and running. Uh, Oh, I know what I forgot to show you. So what's actually is going on on the device. So I'll quickly just do these. I hope they're still visible. Uh, I need to switch back to my device. And here I'll go with Mosquito. As already mentioned, uh, Hedge is uh, using uh, the bus. The bus is... Uh, basically a, a MQTT a connection and so uh, that allows us to actually see the messages we want to see on the device so as you can see there was just some uh, exchange of messages happened so whenever I uh, remove and I'll ask my plugin to get removed there is a bunch of messages as you can see there is actually quite a lot of uh, stuff happening in the background, uh, but because this is all handled by the agent as well as the mapper, uh, we don't have to uh, worry about it on our plugin level. So, so as, you have, as you saw before, I, I, I did not touch MQTT at all. And here we can see uh, our request to remove uh, our plugin. Sorry, not plugin, but the application. Um, right, uh, so the application is not here anymore. Um, just to reiterate, uh, all I have done here today uh, is uh, described in uh, that uh, tutorial. Oh, wrong buttons again. And the, the, uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, so in, in this uh, under the, this uh, URL, uh, you will find that that tutorial. Uh, written by someone uh, from the team. Uh, this is using the shell and, and shows you how to implement Docker, but you can either <laughs> do exactly the thing I, I just did, so, so, so just, just uh, do it in Python, or, or you can implement it in, in any of languages you prefer. And just to also quickly show you uh, the other stuff I was uh, talking about. Uh, the uh, plugin uh, manager plugin API. So uh, that's also nicely described uh, here in, uh, in, in in documentation of the repo. Uh, if you want to uh, look at more of the flow between uh, agent plugins or, or other components, there are also other uh, subsections where you can go and uh, check. Right. Um, I think this is all I have to show you guys today. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope this was useful. Um, and yes, this, this will be published uh, very, very soon uh, in the Finnish uh, examples repository. Thank you so much, Phil. Back over to you. Great. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Lucas. Um, so let, let me just uh, warm up uh, <laughs> this, this material once again. Um, so, uh, a brilliant, brilliant demonstration. Obviously, we're keen to do live coding. To, keen to um, get it, get in there with the uh, with, with the, uh, the positive ne negatives of the, the demo effector sectors. But Lucas, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so one one of the questions I kind of noted as we went through was, um, so you were talking about um, uh, exit codes for certain kind of sys or exit events, and I think you you then went through on the API. Description what those what those exit exit codes were. So you're going to have zero being something, one being something. Uh, do you want to just briefly highlight that once again? Yes, of course. Uh, just give me a second to bring up uh, bring up the other web web pages. Okay, cool. And share again. This this screen share that. Uh, Right, so I'll, I'll do this time. I'll use the documentation. So uh, those uh, exit codes uh, are also highlighted in the tutorial. How to write your own plugin. Um, so yeah, the most basic and and you know the one we you always want to see is the zero exit code that highlights the agent that the operation um, had uh, successful uh, has been successful uh, and 
does not require any, any further operations. Um, the exit code one, uh, as you saw uh, in the example, because uh, this plugin does not support, for example, the update list uh, command. This can uh, this, this this can return uh, that exit code and and also highlight to the agent that it has to use the other method, uh, non default method to to execute. Sorry, to to install the application. So one by one. Uh, the code in, uh, two uh, means that uh, something in the execution. So when, when we try to call uh, the snap in our case, uh, some command failed either due to a permission issue or, or some other. Uh, and altogether with that uh, exit code two, uh, the plugin will return uh, an event uh, which uh, will show you uh, where the logs uh, are. Uh, for the device. Uh, if I have enough time, I, a couple of minutes, I may show you an example log uh, of, of such failed operation. If that would be of interest to anyone. Uh, I think if, it, if it's um, short and sweet, I'm sure the audience would be keen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, this one, this one, okay. Uh, that's my mess here. Okay, um, so Let's quickly cut uh, that in bar log uh, attach agent software. Okay, I've got some other logs, so let's do 20. Whoops. Software update. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll be 22 T yeah, 1527. Okay, so if I cut that file, um, as you can see, uh, it, it contains pretty much all the STD out and STD air of the operation. So there was some some other issues I had. Oh, there were some some list even. Uh, sorry, this is the last invocation of the list command. So it showed that the exit status was zero. Uh, but in the case of error, uh, do I have anything here? I don't think actually this is. Yeah, that, that's actually some some successful operation. But yeah, in case of error, that file path would be uh, past an event, and you can uh, access it via uh, agent again and, and uh, push out to uh, to your uh, device via other operations. And excellent, excellent. Someone said some my screen is gone, I believe. Uh, yeah, I can see it here. So hopefully okay. it's uh, just a temporary glitch in the connection somewhere. All right. um, so, so brilliant, Lucas. I, th I think it's probably useful now just to, um, I think we've got a couple of questions coming through. So uh, one, uh, one additional one for Lucas yourself. So, um, there's a number of um, uh, package management or, or packages that are already um, handled in Stenage.io. So w which ones are already available? Could you just say what those are? Of course. Um, yes, so uh, out of the box, Stenage.io provides the APT plugin, uh, which, which supports the APT and APT get. Uh, so yes, if you require, uh, or if, if, if you're using Ubuntu or, or uh, things based on uh, Debian packages, uh, sorry, supporting Debian packages. Uh, there's one available, uh, and the other officially supported uh, is the Docker plugin, uh, which uh, yeah, was, I think they're, they're, it's based on, on the, the tutorial uh, example, uh, but with a little bit more extended functionality. Yep, excellent, excellent. So and, and soon Snap obviously as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, indeed, indeed. So. Um, so also, so as as you've seen, so we've got some, we had some great practical uh, demonstrations uh, of um, both the finished IO team and also contributors. Um, I'm aware we've just got a couple of minutes, but we we have got a, a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, so uh, one, I think, is to to Rob and Matt um, regarding um, uh, well, basically just stating that finished.io already supports connections to Azure IoT and essentially IoT Hub. Um, so, what what is the advantage of using a Palmer versus a Azure Stream Analytics on on the edge? Um, maybe Robin, Robin, Matt, you you might have a view on that. Um, so you could connect to a remote Azure IoT hub. Is that? I think that's what the uh, example yeah, yeah, was saying. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, the 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 advantage of having the analytics running on the edge is. Just the the processing can be done on the edge, so you you would you would be able to achieve um, a different set of use cases. So where you need to do the processing on the edge, because you know, the, the example I used earlier was when you got a data overload, 
and you, you you want to filter that data or do some pre-processing on the edge before sending it to the cloud or to another system um then having a palmer running on the thin edge on a, on a lightweight device is you know extremely beneficial um if you can do all your processing in the cloud then you yes agreed you have a you have many choices for doing that analytics um azure iot um uh, IoT Hub is a is a, you know, is a is a fine platform um, if you're in the Azure uh, space, um, but I will, you know, will highlight that uh, you know, Palmer's again domain specific language is perfectly suited to do um, event based processing. Um, it makes it very easy to develop, very easy to maintain. Um, it, it is super fast, and if you're in the cloud environment, then uh, you can use the as well as using the code environment. Uh, that, that we showed you can also use the drag and drop environment in um cumulosity to do uh um to do your analysis so uh, yeah yes I, you, I, you I have choices say, yeah i'd also Sorry, say no. another very big uh, and important use case of doing things on the edge is for disconnected uh, use cases, particularly if you have some kind of command and control logic that's based on your analytics, you uh, very much would not want a disconnection from your cloud provider to stop that working locally. So it's one of the other big advantages of doing things locally on the edge. Uh, as Rob says, uh, when you're working, if you're working with Cumulosity rather than Azure, and you know, there are pros and cons in both, then you get a Palmer out of the box there. Uh, the other thing with Azure Stream Analytics, um, they there are some similarities with how you specify things there, but it's um, they don't they have some of the sort of similar SQL like languages for things, but they don't have the ability to drop out into a sort of imperative language, which gives you that little bit of extra flexibility and uh, ability to be dynamic with creating and removing rules um, at runtime based on on what data that you see compared to apartments. So uh, there are definitely pros and cons. Brilliant, excellent, thank you. So um, I'm aware. So that that brings us nicely to a um, uh, a poll uh, we we didn't raise at the right time. So if I launch that poll now, so this is related to the use cases of edge analytics. So it's a nice nice um, kind of run in for that. Um, so wh whether what what the um, keen to get the audience's view of actually what uh, what your use of edge analytics are. So if I let that run for uh, a couple of seconds, so please fill that in with your your views. Um, also, the same time from the um, the finished IO team, <clears throat> we're we're keen to understand what you'd like us to focus on next. Um, so whether this is actually um, more more plugins, uh, kind of analytics, device models, um, kind of device hierarchy, etc. So um, air creation and buffering, brilliant. For the um, the other. Fantastic, thank you, Matthias. Um, <clears throat> so I just launched the the next poll as well. So keen to get your view, views on this one. So hopefully one doesn't um, um, uh, overcome the other one. So <clears throat> from the open source project, very much keen to get your view of actually where you'd like us to focus. Obviously, uh, the, the project's moving forwards where it's a collaborative environment um, with um, sort of key partners moving forwards, but also the community itself. So please. Uh, please uh, give us an indication where you'd like us uh, to, to go and where you'd like us to focus in the future. Um, <clears throat> so whilst, whilst you're doing that, I, I realise we've literally now just run out of time, so we, we kind of changed the approach to, to make uh, to the time for deeper dives, etc. Um, so what I would like to, um, I'd like to thank, thank the presenters, uh, presenters and demonstrators for all the great uh, the demos I've actually shown. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I think the um, uh, from from the sort of comments back so far, I think the the audience yourselves have actually done that as well. Um, I would also like to make you aware that kind of IFM, Software AG, and the, the other contributors are actually recruiting in this space. So so please spread the word uh, throughout your sort of contact networks um, to anybody you you may feel uh, could potentially come on board in a professional capacity in in this um, in this environment and potentially around this kind of open source project. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining us. Keep safe, and we will see you in mid-March for the next meetup. Thank you for attending, and we look forward to speaking with you next time. Thanks.